faced with funeral expenses for your loved one. You've got owned in business for over 135 years. Think smart. Think ahead. Brown Funeral Homes, Martinsburg Inwood, and Charlestown Ransom. We have the tools. We have the talent. It's Miller time. It's Miller time on Talk Radio WRNR. A look at local sports with the play-by-play voice of local sports, Matt Miller. And a happy Friday evening, everybody. The work week is done. The abbreviated work week, at least, having the holiday in the middle of the week. But Friday is here, which means the weekend is officially upon us. For those who are off work by now, Matt Miller and I have another hour and a half with you. And then we start our weekend. Matt Crawford here with you in studio. Matt Miller is joining us from his house. Matt, I guess we're calling this, what are the, the Miller Family Studios? Sure, we could uh, use the uh, lane that we live off of, the Pitzer Chapel Studio. I was going to use that, but I couldn't, I, for the life of me, it, your your street name escaped me at the moment. So, yeah, we can call it the Pitzer Chapel WRNR Studios. We got two of them now. It works. Uh, we're using our remote gear that we normally would use for our game broadcast, uh, running a little test. We'll be doing something, I'm sure, just like this. Not the coming week, but the following week when Rob spends a week of vacation. I'll jump down to those morning shifts and uh, try to join you for Miller time from here at the house. Absolutely. we got a jam-packed show tonight, including a conversation live with Wizards play-by-play man Dave Johnson, one of our favorite guests. And he apparently loves coming on, too, if you've heard the promos or heard him. On the last time, we have Trey Nepper of the Martinsburg Soapbox Derby joining us after the 6 o'clock hour. We will go till 6.30 this evening and take you right up to Washington Nationals baseball. And we got a, a whole lot in between. But before we get started today, um, Matt, I think that you would agree that we want to send our deepest condolences to the Copenhaver family as they go through a very tough time right now. Some news came out today that we won't go into, but we just want them to know that we are sending our thoughts and prayers from Talk Radio WRNR. Absolutely. And, uh, you know, they always know. And uh, I'll be talking with Ben hopefully soon. Uh, you know, the, we'll, we'll be there uh, for whatever they would need in a tough time. Absolutely. All right. Let's move on to sports. Let's start with the Washington Nationals, who at the beginning of the game yesterday, you were thinking, wow, that players only meeting sure didn't do anything. But the Nationals escape a nine run deficit and come back to the biggest rally in Nationals history, and the biggest rally in the major leagues since last year, 130-plus so far this year in nine-run deficits. The Nationals the first one to overcome it this year, and the Nationals go on for the 14-12 to victory. Matt, your thoughts on the game? Well, I sent you a text message last night. I'm trying to see the time a little after 8 o'clock. Said, glad they had the players-only meeting. Might be 10 nothing instead of 7 nothing. Looking good, Nats, with a emoji face that has the tongue sticking out you know i really at the beginning of that game and listening to the first part of that game hearing them fall behind seven to nothing i was very cynical as came out in that message to you i thought wow here we go and really was thinking all right this team may really be in trouble and i'm not saying they may not still be in some trouble but at least to come from behind win like they had last night you know, gives them some momentum. Uh, I read uh, one of the relief pitchers commented that hopefully in another month they look back and see this as a game that catapults them to where they want to be. We'll just wait and see. All I can think about is last weekend. They went into a four-game set with the Philadelphia Phillies, and I believe it was game two they had lost game one and in game two came out and pounded seven home runs put 17 runs on the board won 17 to 7 and came right back out with that subpar offense and got beat in the next two games lost three out of four in that series so while last night's impressive no doubt about it i'm not taking anything away i wish i would have stayed up now long enough to really be a part of that live however they now have to try transfer that into a string of wins and not come back out tonight and lay an egg. Yeah, that is the key. And that is what time will tell really about how good that win really was and whether it was just a fluke they were able to come back or whether this was really a turning point for the Nationals. Well, they were down 9 nothing, and Trey Turner came up to bat and made it 9-1 to with a solo shot. So you're thinking, okay, now that could be something that 
catapults him a little bit to maybe bring it within a couple runs. But, I mean, at 9 nothing, you're not really thinking they're going to win by any stretch of the imagination. Then came the sixth inning, and that was really the inning that told the story of this entire game. The bases were loaded, the Nats were down, and Trey Turner came up to bat again and had some magic and put the Nationals up, and they would never turn around. This was the call last night with Charlie and Dave as Trey Turner put the Nats up on his first grand slam of his career. The one-two. Swing a line drive, left field, deep, going back on it, way back, Dietrich to the wall. It's gone! It's a grand slam for Trey Turner. The Nationals lead improbably. They were down 9-0. It's now 10-9. And I don't know how loud they have their crowd mic up, but if their crowd mic was at normal volume, that was a crowd in D.C. that seemed like it was ready to erupt. And you could hear on that call that that was just almost a sigh of relief going, okay, we finally hit the ball and scored guys that were in, that were in scoring position and got guys around and scored, which is something that the Nationals have struggled with during the last month, month and a half. Yeah, averaging about three runs a game through the month of June and not hitting with runners in scoring position at one point late in the month. It was like a 184-185 team batting average with runners in scoring position and leaving just a ton of runners on base. So last night, they were able to come up with those big hits and get those runs in when they needed to get them in. And hopefully, again, it's something that can really get this offense going. Uh, Trey Turner certainly had a game that uh, line drive, grand slam home run, uh, you know, just ignited that crowd. And let's give the crowd a little credit, too. Uh, It would have been easy to have kind of given up on that game and maybe even left early by the sixth inning. But uh, they estimated that crowd to be right around 24,000 for a Nationals team that's been struggling, no doubt about it, against a Miami team that's not real good on a Thursday night. That's a pretty good crowd and a pretty loud crowd. Yeah, give it to the Nats fans for sticking around. Davey Martinez, the Nationals manager, talked to the media after the game, and something he has reiterated time and time again is just how impressed he has been with the fight of this team. And he started last night talking about how last night was no different. The boys didn't give up. Took a little ownership. That was good. Like I said, they've been playing well. We're just not getting the big hit since tonight. Uh, it was nice to see those guys come through. You know, Trey had an unbelievable, unbelievable day. So good for him. I've said this before, but, you know, for me, he's an all-star. So I hope he makes it. And again, well, we, we have commented on how nice we think Davey Martinez is being with the media. That is one thing he has said over and over again is the Nats keep fighting. And while they may not be getting those runs across the board, that they continue to fight and continue to go out day in and day out. And it's games like this that you wonder why they can't do it at a consistent level. And that'll be the next challenge for them, okay? You did it last night. Number one, the challenge is let's not fall behind nine to nothing. Wins like that don't come very often. But at the same time, again, the biggest thing for them has been their offensive output. I mean, they've typically been getting pretty good starting pitching, although with Geo right now, it's kind of hit and miss. With Tanner Roark right now, it's a little more miss than a hit. You know, Hellickson had a rough one. I understand, though, catching some of the pregame last night, he may have been a little bit under the weather. There's been some kind of a a bug of some sort that has affected a few of the players on the team. So, you know, the pitching has been there. Can they consistently begin to hit the baseball? And here's the hard part, though, too. Let's say this is the start of a turnaround. That turnaround is going to last one week, and then you're going to be off for almost a whole week for the All-Star break, so you hope that doesn't hurt. And the one, I don't want to say black spot on this event, but something we talked about this morning was while, okay, it's nice that they were able to come back and get that victory being down 9 nothing at one point. Let's look at the fact this Nationals team was down 9 nothing very early in the game. Yeah, and, 
you know, give them credit, found a way to come back and get that victory. But again, can't keep putting themselves in these kind of situations because we've seen over the month of June and even into that series against Boston, all they had to do was put themselves down by a couple of runs and they didn't have the offense to come back. Absolutely. All right, man, we got to get in our first break. When we come back, we will talk to the play-by-play man of the Washington Wizards, one of our favorite guests, Dave Johnson, and talk about the big offseason so far for the Washington Wizards. Not necessarily big names, but just making some moves that hopefully are going to help the team in the future. We'll be right back after this break, talking to Dave Johnson. You're listening to Miller Time on Talk Radio WRNR Martinsburg. but your finances shouldn't have to be. At BCT, we simplify your financial life. Bank of Charlestown is a locally owned community bank with seven conveniently located offices serving the eastern panhandle of West Virginia, Middleburg, Virginia, and their newest office in Hagerstown, Maryland. With over 140 years of experience, BCT is the tri-state area's choice for fast, convenient, and hassle-free banking solutions. Whether you are a high school senior looking for a student checking account, a college graduate purchasing a new car, a first-time home buyer, or investing for retirement, BCT has flexible solutions to fit your lifestyle. BCT is committed to providing everyday ways to simplify your financial life. Also, make sure you are following BCT on Twitter and Instagram at MyBCT or like their Facebook page to see how BCT reinvests local deposits back into the communities they serve. BCT, we simplify your financial life. Member FDIC, equal housing lender. I'm Steve Weissman with NFL Network Now on the Westwood One Radio Network. The Steelers and Le'Veon Bell have until July 16th at 4 p.m. Eastern to get a long-term deal in place. While time is running out, Hall of Famer Jerome Bettis thinks both sides need each other. The former Steeler told TMZ that Bell won't be as good if he ends up playing for another team. Bell would be playing his second straight season under the franchise tag. Elsewhere, wideout Calvin Ridley making it official Thursday, signing his rookie deal with the Falcons. The 26 overall pick joins another former Crimson Tide wideout, Julio Jones, in Atlanta. The Falcons now have their entire rookie class under contract. The Broncos have all their rookies under contract as well. They signed running back Royce Freeman Thursday. Third-round pick is expected to compete for a starting job after Denver released C.J. Anderson this offseason. This has been NFL Network Now on the Westwood One Radio Network. Napa Know How. This week only, Napa Full Synthetic Motor Oil is on sale for just $2.99 a quart. Wait, what? $2.99? That's got to be wrong. Let me fact check that real quick here. Well, I'll be a minivan's uncle. The sludge-fighting, long-lasting protection of Napa Full Synthetic is just $2.99 a quart. Quality parts, helpful people. That's Napa know-how. Napa know-how. General states pricing. Sales prices do not include applicable state local taxes or recycling fees. Offer available July 1st through July 8th. If you have hard water, the lime scale not only leaves white spots, it clogs pipes and breaks down appliances, costing you hundreds of dollars in energy and wear. Eliminate lime scale and other water issues like brown staining, bad odors, and lead with HydroCare water products available from Wave Home Solutions. Wave's affordable systems don't use salts or chemicals. You'll love the way your water tastes, smells, and looks. Satisfaction guaranteed. For more information, go to goodclearwater.com. That's goodclearwater.com. If you're a victim in a motor vehicle wreck or injured due to another person's fault, at Ferretti Law Office, we get to work protecting your rights and getting you the money you need and deserve. The insurance companies handling your claims want a fast and cheap settlement. Before making that mistake, call Ferretti Law Office at 264-8505 to discuss your claim for free. You did not choose to be injured, but your choice of law firms can make a difference. At Ferretti Law Office, we're here to help. It's time for your Berkeley County Health Department summer safety tips. In this segment, Kara Harding advises us on safe grilling temperatures. Some people like their burgers well done. Some like them medium. You really should temp it to 155 on your burgers. With steaks, two minutes on each side is the rule of thumb. But chicken too, uh, a lot of times people are barbecuing chicken and such, and that's your highest cooking temperature of 165 degrees. Have a safe summer from the Berkeley County Health Department. Find out more at bchealthdept.org. One 
and welcome you back into Miller Time on this Friday afternoon slash evening. I know I reported before the break that we would be talking to Dave Johnson, the play-by-play voice of the Wizards. Just got off the phone with him, and he has had a issue come up with Channel 4 and uh, something regarding the Maryland basketball team. I assume they're doing some sort of sports report on the fact that a couple of subpoenas were sent out today in regards to the NCAA probe. That happened with the whole Louisville scandal and a bunch of other teams and players. So we think we're going to talk to him about 445, I believe is what he said. So we hope to talk to him a little bit later. But right now he is a little preoccupied with some some DC TV. So, Matt, apparently we are not number one on the list anymore. That's all right. Hey, he is the hardest working man in D.C. sports. There is no doubt about it. All he does between the Wizards and the United and other uh, radio appearances, WTOP, I believe it is, uh, uh, the the TV work. I mean, he is at it constantly. And so uh, we can be put on the back burner for a half an hour. Absolutely. And I'll have to, uh, being a diehard Maryland basketball fan, I think I'll have to, to dedicate at least a question to that and ask what he has heard and what's going on with that investigation right now. Well, and certainly a big story, not only if you're a Maryland fan or not, but just as a college basketball fan, this has been an all-encompassing uh, investigation that you know has taken down some big coaches and big programs. Yeah, absolutely. All right, Matt, well, we're going to adjust topics then. We were going to talk some Wizards, and we're going to flip-flop what we were going to talk about at about 545, and we're still going to talk some NBA but it's more along the lines of Carmelo Anthony. Man, I don't know if you saw today, but Carmelo and the Thunder agreed to part ways sometime this summer. A very strange story that, that they're announcing that sometime this summer it, it will happen and not just an immediate release. I thought that was kind of weird, but it's the NBA, so I don't ask questions. But I reading articles on ESPN and on CBS Sports all day, it just amazes me that the first articles about this are not, okay, where's Carmelo going to go? Where does he fit well? It's who's he going to team up with? And the fact that that is the first thing across people's mind about the NBA right now really just irritates me. It's the league. I mean, it's just it's where it is right now. You've got the, the quote-unquote super teams out there, uh, particularly – in the West, where you've got the Warriors and what they've done, winning three of the last four NBA championships, and frankly, maybe should have won all four when you look at how that one series with Cleveland played out. You've got a Rockets team that, you know, built itself in the offseason to really be a contender and uh, be right there to battle with Golden State. You know, you've watched what the 76ers have done and, you know, really – going through some rough seasons to kind of get where they are now in order to, you know, get those young draft picks and so forth. And then those young guys are beginning to blossom. You look at what the Celtics have been able to do. Danny Ainge has been just an incredible general manager, uh, probably as good, if not a better GM than he was as a player. And he was pretty good on the floor at times. Uh, the way that he's been able to, you know, stock and use draft picks and, and make the right trades and moves to be able to build that team it it's just kind of a thing right now so where do you want to go who do you want to play with to try to become the next part or cog in a machine that can maybe go win an nba championship to me it just takes if i'm a player i want to go not necessarily where i can be a superstar but if i'm at the carmelo anthony superstardom level obviously not the way he was when he was with the Knicks or especially when he at the beginning of his career was with the Nuggets out in Denver. But when you're at the level that Carmelo Anthony is and you have that sort of talent and have been an NBA star for a long time now, why would you want to go play second fiddle to somebody? Why would you want to be a part of a two-man operating system? Why wouldn't you want to go somewhere that gives you the – or puts you in the best position to make you successful as a player? It's all about winning championships. I mean, especially for Carmelo, who's been in the league as long as he has. I'm assuming that what it all means is he's got to be looking for that 
fit where he can go and be, uh, again, just a, a cog in that engine as opposed to maybe being the lead cog, so to speak, or the center of the spoke. He can just be one of those spokes to finally get something that has eluded him throughout his NBA career. But it's hard, too, because... You look at, at the Lakers and what they've done to bring in LeBron James, and then they've added some other pieces around him. You've got salary caps and, and contractual issues that you have to look at. So there may be a, a, a particular player or, or group of players on a team that he might like to join, but there just may not be that opportunity. So I'm assuming he's looking for what will be the best fit for him and still give him that best opportunity to succeed and win a championship. See, to me, that's it. And I guess that's just the competitor in me to not just jump on a team that I don't want to say are guaranteed because nothing's guaranteed in the world of sports. But the closest thing to a guarantee of at least getting to a conference final and getting to a championship, to me, the, the, the competitor inside of me would want the challenge more than anything. Well, but just winning an NBA championship is a challenge. You know, so many good players, uh, good coaches. Good organizations have, have struggled to get to that level. And so, you know, there, there's always going to be that challenge. You know, it might even be a little bit of a challenge to put yourself in the back seat when you're used to kind of being the, the lead guy. So, you know, maybe there are different challenges at this stage in his career. Well, right now, the three main contenders that this ESPN writer wrote about was joining Dwayne Wade in Miami. OK, a possibility of maybe competing against the Celtics and being the top two teams in the East with that combination. Going to Houston and being with CP3, who just signed a big contract in Houston, or going and becoming the next megastar of the Los Angeles Lakers and being a part of the LeBron L.A. team. I, I just to me, I'm thinking, why would you want to join the Western Conference right now unless you were going to join the Golden State Warriors, who apparently don't want him? Boy, just listening to you, and then I'm trying to come up with the words because when, when the first team you mentioned is the Heat and maybe teaming up with Dwayne Wade. It's LeBron uh, part two, isn't it? Well, but it's not because you're talking, you know, D. Wade is, is nearing the end of his career. Uh, and frankly, so too is Carmelo Anthony. And so while those two guys together – you know, may be good for one another, may be good for Miami, may make them competitive. I certainly would not put Miami as a team that I would say is going to contend for an NBA championship just because they add the offense of Carmelo Anthony and the lack of defense of Carmelo Anthony. But look at the Eastern Conference. It's not There is no Cleveland anymore, we don't think. I mean, those young guys without... LeBron James could end up flourishing. We don't know. Toronto is going to have the same group of guys that couldn't really succeed deep in the playoffs. You're going to have really Boston. And who, who else in the Eastern Conference? Philadelphia. I mean, Philadelphia, assuming they can continue the streak and trust the process that, they're, that they've been on the last couple of years. I mean, maybe the Wizards, depending on what they look like next year. But, I mean, you go down to Miami – and you have a decent supporting cast around you, and you add the experience of and the talent of Dwayne Wade and Carmelo Anthony. To me, that just seems like you're going to, that's more of a fast track to a conference final than joining somewhere in the Western Conference. And you, unless you're joining LA, then, I, but I, again, I don't see, I don't see Carmelo wanting to hop on the bandwagon. If that's the fast track, to an Eastern Conference final to put two old stars together, then the Washington Wizards certainly ought to come out and be ready and able to compete for that same level when you look at the younger stars and the caliber of those stars that are on that Wizards roster. So, again, I'm, I'm just struggling to think that I, I, I just... <laughs> Pardon me, but I went and saw Uncle Drew with my son, Brandon, and I, it, I'm i just thinking this this is an NBA version of Uncle Drew right now, putting two old stars together and thinking the Heat are going to win the East. But again, I mean, obviously, it's the East is going to be subpar of the West just based on past history and what's gone on over this offseason. So really, any, anywhere you go in the East, you're going to be competing for an Eastern Conference final, and that's about it. 
Uh, possibly. And, and don't don't forget Milwaukee, who, you know, made the postseason last year and has some good young talent that, you know, could could move up the ladder a little bit as well in the East. All right, now we got to get into our bottom of the hour break, which features news, weather, and a NBC Sports update. We'll be back after this break with more familiar. <laughs> CBS News updates, droughts and high temperatures in many parts of the West aren't making the crews any life uh, for them any easier. We are fighting dozens of wildfires across the region. A fire in San Diego County has burned several houses and knocked out power to hundreds of customers. A wildfire near California's border with Oregon's killed one person. Lisa Dedarian with the city of Pasadena says it is dangerously hot out there. We're looking at triple-digit temperatures around 112 for the city of Pasadena. She says people need to think twice before staying outside for very long. We have a lot of people that use a rose bowl loop for recreational purposes, bike riders, runners. So we actually will patrol that area and, and kind of look for signs of distress in people. But they don't take the heat into consideration. They'll go out there midday. One of Colorado's most popular national parks has banned all campfires to avoid starting any new wildfires. Under the ban that takes effect today, fires aren't permitted anywhere in Rocky Mountain National Park. CBS News Update. I'm Sam Litzinger. Now, with your local forecast, weatherman Bob Coogan. Dry weather and noticeably cooler here through the evening time and even chillier late night. We'll see partly cloudy skies with a low by sunrise near 60. For the daytime for tomorrow, we've got more sunshine on the way. Temperatures much more comfortable than they've been in the last week or so. We'll look at a high near 80. Clear skies tomorrow night. Lows in the middle 50s to start Sunday. I'm Bob Cookin, Talk Radio, WRNR. The future doesn't wait. Why should you? Blue Ridge Community and Technical College offers over 50 degree and certificate programs in education, IT, culinary arts, engineering, and so much more. Small class sizes, flexible schedules with evening and online classes, with affordable tuition, plus financial aid is available to those who qualify. Now you can go to college. Visit us online at blueridgectc.edu. That's blueridgectc.edu. Stop waiting and enroll today. L.A. Roberts is Berkeley County's oldest jeweler, where every season is new and exciting. In fact, new is old school to us, and though it's nothing new, our old traditions like exceptional service, quality, and value maintain L.A. Roberts jewelers as the old master among so many new kids on the block. Whether you are a newcomer or part of the old guard, entrust all your fine jewelry needs to L.A. Roberts, old world jewelers for a new age in historic downtown Martinsburg. Your NBC Sports Radio update starts now. No more for Neymar. I'm Jeff Biggs. Had a big upset today at the World Cup Brazil. The heavy favorites lost to Belgium 2-1. to Well, France took care of Uruguay 2-0. In the NBA, a couple of moves. One in San Antonio, Tony Parker leaving the Spurs after 18 seasons to take a two-year $10 million deal with the Hornets. And it's a one-and-done for Carmelo Anthony, who is out in OKC after just one season. The Thunder payroll is now over $300 million, with Melo set to make 27.9. The weekend of baseball has started. Daytime action to Wrigley. The Cubs are going for seven in a row, but they are down to their last out. They have a runner on second with two out, but the Reds are trying to close it out up three to two. Tennis action at Wimbledon today. Wins for Serena Williams and American John Isner, but Venus Williams and Madison Keys both lost. NBC Sports Radio. Let's see. Load the clothes in the washing machine. Add detergent. Turn on the washer. Wait, where's all this water coming from? Oh, no! Disasters happen. Fire, water, and natural disasters. Tell your insurance provider you prefer Blue Ridge Property Restore. Blue Ridge Property Restore. Getting you back from disaster faster. She's gonna kill me. Come out Friday, July 13th and support the Spring Mills football program in their first annual golf tournament fundraiser at the Woods Golf Resort in Hedgesville. This tournament is a four-man shotgun scramble, teeing off at 10 a.m. If you wish to donate more than the entry fee, we have several different sponsorship levels and we'll be accepting cash donations. So come out and support your Cardinal football team and enjoy some time on the golf course. For more information, call Ted Williams at 304-704-8311 or Scott Highmiller at 301-788-5732.
Welcome back into this Friday edition of Miller Time. Matt Crawford here with you in studio. Matt Miller joining us from the Pitzer's Chapel WRNR studios, a.k.a. his house sitting in his living room. Matt, is it a little more comfy than sitting in the studio? Yeah, I think so. I'm, I'm sitting back in a rocking chair right now, looking out the window uh, at the beautiful afternoon, thinking about some other yard work that I've got to get done. So I'm doing all right. Well, I'm sitting here looking at our interns, so I think you have the slightly better view <laughs> as they both stare at me as I say that. All right, bottom of the hour, it is 536, and that means it is time to look at yesterday in the sports history. We are looking at the 5th of July in yesterday in sports history. We will start in 1904, the New York Giants baseball team have an 18-game winning streak snapped by the Philadelphia Phillies as the Phillies get a 6-5 win in the 10th inning. So the Giants very close to making that a 19-game win streak, and who knows after that. In 1914, the Boston Braves, 26-40, and 40, are 15 games back in the NL. And this is, again, early part of July. They would go on to win the World Series and sweep the Philadelphia A's. So not a bad rebound for the Boston Braves, so maybe the Orioles can do that this year. Just kidding. Moving on down the list, 1937 Yankees outfielder Joe DiMaggio hits his 20th home run of the season, and that is his first career Grand Slam, an 8-4 win over the Yankees' arch rival, the Boston Red Sox. Moving on down the list, trying to get a little bit closer to this area. Again, a lot of stuff dealing with tennis. It is it is. It is Wimbledon time over across the pond. We'll do a Wimbledon yesterday in sports history for you. 1975, Arthur Ashe becomes the first African-American to win Wimbledon, beating Jimmy Connors. And I'm not even going to try to tell you what those scores were. Matt, if you were here, you could probably tell me because you are the tennis expert between us. I, I wouldn't say expert. I, I played back in my high school days. But. All right, well, they were 6-1, to 6-1, to 5-7, to and 6-4. to four. There you go. Those are just numbers to me, but I'm not sure what exactly that means. That means he won the set six games to one, six games to one. Then what was the next one? Uh, going back. Uh, five, seven five, or seven. something. So lost that one and then came back and won the next one. So it's the best three out of five in those sets. If you say so. 1987, A's first baseman Mark McGuire becomes the first rookie to hit 30 home runs before the Major League Baseball All-Star Game in a 6-2 win over the Red Sox, but we all know what could have been helping Mark McGuire hit those home runs. No, no, no. That was the rookie year you said, right? Yes. I don't think there was anything going on in that rookie year. Yeah, you never know. 1989, Barry Bonds homers in Pittsburgh. 6-4 to four loss versus his future team, the San Francisco Giants, joining his father, Bobby Bonds, as the MLB's Father and son home run record holders at 408. Did the Griffies break that? I assume they did, right? I'd have to look that up. I don't know off the top of my head. I know. I mean, I know Barry Bonds hit more home runs than Ken Griffey Jr. did, but I don't. Have, I'm not sure how many home runs Bobby Bonds hit. That'd be something to definitely look up. 1991 MLB owners approved Colorado Rockies and Florida Marlins as new NL franchises. They started playing two years later in 1993 and one more for you before we move on in 1998 we'll go a little bit more modern the new york yankees beat the baltimore orioles one nothing to improve to 61 and 20 equaling the best 81 game start in major league baseball history so the yankees were phenomenal that year beating the orioles and the orioles were phenomenally bad this year losing to everyone the Orioles, been rough the, for the Orioles. Yeah, by the way, lost 5-2 to two last night against Minnesota. They will play at Minnesota again tonight at 8-10. That is your look at yesterday in sports history. All right, Matt, let's stay with the baseball topic, and let's talk some minor league baseball as the Hagerstown Suns were no hit last night. What a shame they lose again. Oh, no, wait. They win one nothing. How is that possible? Getting no hit and winning a game? Yep, they got no hit through nine innings. Won one nothing. Except we're only telling you about half the stats there. They lost. They won ten in ten innings, one to nothing, beating the Delmarva Shorebirds. And it was a new rule that the that Major League Baseball is trying out on Minor League Baseball that allows in extra innings, 
teams to put a runner on second base to start the inning. And a bunt for a single, move that runner to third base, and a pass ball wins the game for Hagerstown. I'm sorry, that's not baseball. That's T-ball, and that's cheating. That there, This should not be a rule. I, you will not move me from this fact, and I think we agree on this, Matt, but that should not be a rule in any form of baseball. That you, Once you get to extra innings, hey, why don't you go ahead and get an advantage and put a runner on second base? I get both teams get to do it, but still, that, that, that's not part of the game. you got to earn your way around the bases. You've got to earn your way on base. Think about that scenario. You've got a couple of different pitchers. Uh, I haven't seen the complete box score, but from what I read from Sean Mernon, it does not appear that the same pitcher went the distance or went to the nine innings as far as the no-hitter, and then they went to the bullpen in that 10th inning. But just think, you've got a, a team pitching staff that has not allowed a hit and yet you're going to start the 10th inning by automatically giving the opposing team a runner at second base. They haven't even earned a place at first other than, you know, a walk or an error during the course of the game. And yet you're going to put a runner at second base and now give this team that to this point doesn't even have a hit an opportunity to lay down a bunt, you know, the goal there, let's sacrifice and get him to third and try to get this run in. And the bunt is a good one, actually ends up being the first and only hit for the Suns. But then the, the next thing that happens is a, a wild pitch. You know, maybe that pitcher gets out of that inning without any damage, without throwing that wild pitch. But you've put that pitcher now in a bad situation, not because of anything that he's done, but because of what you've mandated by putting a runner at second. Yeah, and again, I don't think there's any reason to put a runner at second base, period. But if you're going to do it, if you're going to put a runner at second, make it you can put one there if there's not there after one out. Because a sacrifice bunt and a sacrifice fly, there can be two outs and you can win the game without ever getting anybody else on base. I mean, again, I don't think there should be a runner given to anybody. But if you're going to do it, you shouldn't allow a team to win a game without getting another base runner on base. Because, again, you put somebody on with two at, with no outs and a runner on second, a sacrifice fly, a bunt, anything. You can have back-to-back -back sacrifice flies and win the game and only have two outs in the inning and nobody got on base. So at least make it a little bit different where you put them on base and give some or, or put them on base if they haven't gotten anybody on and record their first out because then at least you can't move the guy over twice and he wins. I don't know. I still have issues with that. So, I mean, if so I'm an opposing I, pitcher and I've gotten the first two outs of an inning and now you go, all right, well, because it's the 10th and there are two outs, we're going to go ahead and put a guy at second base. And now, you know, I miss my spot. I leave a pitch up just a little bit and a guy singles into left or, or doubles even into a gap somewhere. Suddenly, because I made one mistake, I now give up a run and potentially lose the game, whereas if you don't put that runner on, then I'm still pitching with a guy at second that, you know, I put there. I realize, okay, I made a mistake, or even if I tip my cap to him and say, hey, he hit a good pitch, now I still have a chance to go back out and try to get this next batter. I, I'm, I struggle putting the guy on, period. If you don't earn your way on, then you're not on the basis. Yeah, I 100% agree with you that I wouldn't put him on in any way, shape, or form. But with the way they're trying it right now, it's absolutely insane. And if this ever gets to the major leagues, I think it's going to turn off a lot of fans. And it's going to make me look at baseball a little bit different, knowing that you're not going to, once you get to extra innings, you're not going to have to earn your way on. Why are we so concerned about length of games when it comes to the game itself and we're willing to change basic, simple elements or rules of the game all in an effort to quote-unquote speed it up while the very thing that holds the game back from what it was even 20 years ago is all of the dadgum advertising and the breaks and the length of breaks that have to be there because of commercials for television, not so much for radio as much as it is for TV. But, you know, I mean, there are so many elements that are outside of the game that have added to the length of a game. And yet, because we can't give up that revenue, because we've got to make money, we've got to find ways to change the game to make it faster and we'll do that by fundamentally changing the game and that's ridiculous yeah and they want to speed the game up yet they at the same time they're finding ways to speed the game up they're adding instant replay 
which slows everything down. That's it. Hold on. I need to go see whether he was safe or not. Yeah, let's take 15 minutes and decide whether he's safe or not, and that's just going to slow down the game more than anything else will. So I, Major League Baseball's got – they're having an identity crisis at the moment and need to figure it out, but I hope that that rule never, ever – gets to the major leagues, and I really don't think it ever will. I think that the traditionalists will never let that reach the major league level. I'm with you. All right, Matt, we got to get in our break, and hopefully after this break we will hear from Dave Johnson, the play-by-play voice of the Washington Wizards. Again, he was held up in D.C. doing a spot or doing a report on the Maryland basketball team who's had some NCAA pros and subpoenas filed against them today so hopefully we can get him on and talk a little bit about that and a little bit about the washington wizards so you're listening to miller time on talk radio wrnr no idea paradise was hiding right here dipping our toes in 1977 farmers and mechanics insurance companies have proudly supported our local community farmers and mechanics has the insurance products to meet your needs including home auto farm dwelling fire business owners and umbrella coverage. Please contact your local independent agency for a review of your insurance needs and ask for a policy from the company that knows you best. Farmers and Mechanics Insurance Companies, just off Edwin Miller Boulevard on Administrative Drive in Martinsburg. FMIWV.com. The 28th season of the Contemporary American Theater Festival returns to Shepherd University, July 6th through the 29th. A chance to see six bold new plays, including A Late Morning in America with Ronald Reagan. This world premiere from award-winning playwright Michael Weller takes us to a casual sit-down with the former president for recollections that only the First Lady might know. For a full schedule and more information, go to CATF.org. Hello, this is Delegate Mike Folk, candidate for West Virginia Senate District 16. I want to extend my personal congratulations to all the Little League All-Stars this summer. As a former three-sport athlete and Shepherd football player, I understand the importance of discipline, hard work, and perseverance, something our All-Stars have in common. As you continue your journey through this summer and your life, remember this quote from Hall of Famer Jerry Rice, who said, Today I will do what others won't, so tomorrow I can accomplish what others can't. Best of luck and have a great tournament. Simply free e-checking from City National Bank. Perfect if you want basic checking with no monthly service fees or balance requirements. Stop by any of our seven Eastern Panhandle locations or visit us online at bankatcity.com. City National Bank. Member FDIC. Equal housing lender. My friend, when you propose to her the ring she says yes to and that she slips onto her finger, that ring is going to end up on Facebook within a matter of minutes. You propose, she screams, she says yes, she wraps her arms around you, you kiss crazy long. She puts that ring on, and in short order, that ring and your proposal are on Facebook. At Becca Jewelers, we say, let's make sure that her diamond and that ring that all those folks are going to see on Facebook, let's make sure they draw comments like crazy. I'm Lori from Becca Jewelers. We know the kind of diamond and setting that she wants and that you want for her. It's why we have the latest styles. Hundreds that you and she can look through and try on. You're looking for that one ring that makes her stop, hold her hand out, move it slowly to catch the light and her eyes and her heart. We'll help you find that ring. At Bechtel Jewelers, Route 11 South in Inwood. Come see us and we want to see those pictures that end up on Facebook. Welcome back into Miller Time. Matt Crawford here with you in studio. Matt Miller joining us from the Pitcher's Chapel location of Talk Radio WRNR and joining us from his living room. Matt, we have on the WVU Medicine Berkeley Medical Center talk line the play-by-play voice of the Washington Wizards. But we're going to start, if it's okay with you, in a different direction and ask what's going on with the University of Maryland Terrapins. We welcome in Dave Johnson. And Dave, being a original native of Southern Anne Arundel County. I grew up a diehard Maryland basketball fan and getting the alerts on my phone this morning about how a couple of subpoenas were being given, including to assistant coach Bino Ransom. Any new news on the investigations? No, I mean, I think it's, it, it appears to be uh, just part of the, obviously a wider investigation that in fact, nine schools have received uh, subpoenas uh, for assistant coaches at, at various schools uh, actually have been indicted, but not Maryland. Um, and, and of course, this centers around an investigation that included, you know, scrutiny for 
Rick Pitino that led to his firing at the University of Louisville, but it you know should be noted that you know Pitino, while fired from the University of Louisville, has never been uh, indicted or, or charged with with anything. And you know from the University of Maryland's uh, standpoint, I, I think that the two words are, are competence and cooperation. They're releasing the documents just like other schools have. I mean, uh, you know, apparently you know one involves uh, alleged or possible improper payments. Uh, by an agent to a former player and, and other involves, uh, the other subpoena apparently involves, um, you know, just records on the recruitment of a player who did not go to the University of Maryland. So, you know, on its surface, it, it just seems like the school, which is cooperating with, uh, with a, um, with an uh, investigation in big time college basketball and certainly Maryland qualifies as being part of, uh, big time college basketball. So at this point, there's, you know, no indication that the school is, is violated any federal or NCAA laws. So no reason for the school, and everybody seems perfectly content and not too nervous right now, other than the fact that there's been subpoenas being given. Yeah, no, it's just I mean, again, it's it, it, this it, when you think about it, nine subpoena, nine schools have been subpoenaed for some information, and there've only been uh, you know four indictments. It's it's um, but you know it would not be um, it, it doesn't strike me as being out of the ordinary that that Maryland is is one of the big college basketball schools in this country, so it doesn't. You know, surprise me that that the FBI, I'm sure, the FBI, I'm sure, is looking into every school as part of their, uh, uh, you know, in, investigation. I mean, that, that's just my opinion. I'm not a, a FBI expert by any stretch, or even an expert on this this case. But from what I know of it, is it, it's involving a former player and a, and a player that actually did not go uh, to the University of Maryland. So, you know, the, the school has been pretty upfront and transparent about this, and. Um, you know, this is you know part of big time college athletics that, that we uh, we wish it was a, a, a simpler world, but because of um, there are rules and there are laws and et cetera, et cetera, and, and there's there's a lot of money involved. Uh, you know, these stories will continue to come up as uh, you know schools um, have to you know be transparent, and especially in the well, uh, you know, especially in the University of Maryland's case, uh, it's obviously a state school as well. So it's 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 extra important probably to to be transparent. But no school, private or otherwise, should uh, should violate anything. And there's no indication here Maryland has. Dave, do you see some of this being, uh, I guess, an issue with the one and done rule that had been in place in college basketball? You know, I, look as, as long as as long as uh, college basketball has, has been. You know, going on and big time college athletics. Uh, you know, it, it's like the old saying: the, the the good old days weren't always good, and, the, and tomorrow's not as bad as it seems. With a Billy Joel song there, I think you know maybe it's more prevalent today, maybe whatever. But there, there used to be a joke about you know this is a joke from fifty years ago that that you know a, a college football player would have to take a pay cut to go play pro football. So you know. <laughs> It's it's is it more prevalent than the one and done? I mean, this is you know allegedly involving something involving an agent and not not the, the school at all. So it's it, it you know it's not going to be. Um, there were there was a betting scandal fifty years ago that that uh, if, if you Google things. So my point being is is that as much as we we have angst about you know what's happening in, in twenty eighteen and the amount of money that's involved in twenty eighteen and the way things have changed. Uh, you know, there, there's always been an unfortunate side to to uh, amateur athletics, for lack of a better description, and and I, I think there always will be some concerns, and that's why you know you're going to have to have the relevant bodies police it and and uh, do the best they can to keep it as pure as they can. All right, let's move on to Wizards basketball, and we appreciate your input on that, Dave. Absolutely, and let's moving on, moving on to Wizards basketball. Not necessarily any high-profile pickups. I mean, Dwight Howard six years ago would have been a high-profile pickup, but de the Wizards have definitely been active so far in the offseason. What are your views on the two acquisitions so far? Well, I mean, with, with the Dwight Howard you know, situation, uh, they've got to wait for, for all the um, uh, paperwork and, and all that you know, to, to clear. So it's... Uh, uh, but obviously that's been talked about. I mean, the, the, you know, the Jeff Green situation, same same deal, uh, waiting for, for some other things to, to happen on that. And, and obviously Austin Rivers, they, that is done. It's, it's part of a, a trade for, for Marching Gortat. So, 
you know, I, I think it's it's a it's it's part of the life in the NBA where you you have to. Uh, not every team's going to get LeBron James, um, and, and not every you know team is is going to get that that mega superstar. But I think you know what the Wizards have done. You you try to you have to manage within the salary cap. Uh, you know, the deal with Austin Rivers, you know, fits into the, the way this team plays. Um, and, and, you know, he was a player that was making similar money to Marching Gortat. It goes to the LA Clippers, uh, you know, expected to lose DeAndre Jordan. So um, I, I think it, it fitted more into what we were looking for. And, and uh, you know, I, I think it's it's a case now where the Wizards do have a strong core when you talk about John Wall and Bradley Beal and, and Otto Porter, and, and again, a strong core. I mean, we're talking about an NBA where, you know, once upon a time there was a there was a special league for players six foot six inches and under. It was in the late eighties. It was called the World Basketball League because the NBA was very much a big man league. League now it's 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 small ball and it's it's more open scoring and the three point shot, which I'm old enough to remember when I thought, well, that would just be a a desperation shot at the end of a. Uh, of a shot clock now is, 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 is like a layup or it's part of a, part of the game plan. So, um, and, and you know, the, the potential acquisition of, of Dwight Howard, if you, you know, obviously he's, he's not a good free throw shooter, but if you look at the numbers, he, he continues to put up, uh, you know, he can, he can be certainly, a, you know, a, a big contribution to a team in just two seasons ago, he was part of a playoff team. So, um, you know, I, it, it's what every, the Lakers are going to steal the headlines and the Warriors and, and whatever, but there are 30 teams in the NBA. So uh, the Wizards are, are a, a playoff team within that, that sphere, and, and they have to uh, navigate through what they can to, to build on what already is a competitive, successful team. This is a team that you know is trying to graduate from 45 wins and, and, and thereabouts, that neighborhood, to above 50 wins. When you look at the roster as it sets now and, and the adjustments or changes that have been made and, and the pending ones that are coming, uh, do you see this being perhaps maybe a more athletic up and down the floor type of team? Yeah. I mean, I think, um, it, you know, that's, that's the way they're going to, you know, when you, when you've got John Wall running, the, running the show, that's, that's, you know, that's the way you're going to play. And, and so, um, I think that's definitely fair to say, and that's definitely more the way they, you know, not only the Wizards want to go, but, uh, or, or, you know, the, the entire NBA wants to go as well. So, um, you know, I think it, it's going to be, uh, it's a team that, that, you know, quite frankly, you know, should have done better last year. And they know that. And, and, uh, and they understand the, the responsibility that, that's on them to try to, you know, they've done the, the second round business. Now they've, they've got to, you know, push past that. And, uh, uh, you know, this is a team that it, it, there's a window of opportunity. It's just like in this town, we were saying the same thing about uh, the Capitals. Where, you know, it's, it's a window missed on Alex Ovechkin. Well, it turned out this year with a team with, with less talent actually went all the way and won the, won the Stanley Cup. So um, I, Scott Brooks is, is a very good coach. I said this from the beginning. Uh, in, in Scott Brooks, the, the, you know, the Wizards in some ways, you know, uh, this is an acquisition that, that also makes a difference. And, and I think about, you know, before the 16-17 season, I looked at that team on paper, and it was not as good as the team that missed the playoffs in the 15-16 season. But uh, it was a team that, you know, went to the second round and, and took the Boston Celtics to seven games. And, it, you know, it seemed like they had the momentum in that series, but they didn't win the seventh game. So I, I think they've got a, a good structure in place with Wall, with Beal, with Scott Brooks. Uh, as the head coach, uh, you know, if the, if, the, if the Jeff Green deal does go through, uh, you know, he's going to be coming home and, and certainly with, with something, you know, he's got a winning pedigree about him. And also a lot of people gave up on him. He, he's shown that, uh, you know, they shouldn't have given up on him because he can still be a valuable contributor in the NBA. Well, Dave, we appreciate the time and we look forward to catching up with you as the summer goes on, and as the season gets closer. It's getting closer already. It I is. It's, it's, it's gone. So it'll be right around the corner as soon as we know it. You, you, you better enjoy this weekend. The summer's gone. <laughs> <laughs> Dave Johnson, thank you very much for joining us again. One of our favorite guests. Take care. Take care. Again, that was Dave Johnson, the play-by-play voice of the Washington Wizards and giving us some college basketball insight. Again, he is the hardest-working guy in the D.C. sports 
area that I, I think I, I don't think anybody would argue with that if anybody knows his schedule and just a guy that does a little bit of everything so we appreciate him taking some time to talk with us this evening and Matt a lot of anticipation around the Washington Wizards and it should be an interesting season that as you heard Dave Johnson say is very very close and right around the corner all right we got to get in our top of the hour break as we will come back taking you to Washington Nationals baseball and at the end of this break we'll hear from Trey Nepper of the Martinsburg Soapbox Derby. He was wanting us to talk about their send-off to Akron, Ohio on Monday. You're listening to Talk Radio WRNR and Miller Time. RNR News. Now, with your local forecast, weatherman Bob Kukin. Dry weather and noticeably cooler here through the evening time and even chillier late night. We'll see partly cloudy skies with a low by sunrise near 60. For the daytime for tomorrow, we've got more sunshine on the way. Temperatures much more comfortable than they've been in the last week or so. We're looking high near 80. Clear skies tomorrow night. Lows in the middle 50s to start Sunday. I'm Bob Cookin, Talk Radio, WRNR. If you have something on your property and that critter is damaging your property, right. is it legal to shoot that critter? The highest ranking law enforcement <laughs> official in the state has been brought in to answer this you know, question. We, we go to the top when we need answers. What about it, Mr. Attorney General? If David Welch shoots a woodpecker damaging his deck, is that legal in the state of West Virginia? This should be a LeBar exam. <laughs> Eastern Panhandle Talk with Rob and David. What did you listen to last week? WVU Medicine welcomes Dr. Sarika Bagri to the staff at WVU Medicine Primary Care Inwood. Dr. Bagri is board certified in internal medicine and is now accepting new patients at Primary Care Inwood. Conveniently located at 5047 Jarrettstown Road, Suite 2B in the Inwood Medical Building. For more information or to schedule an appointment with Dr. Bagri, call WVU Medicine Primary Care Inwood at 304-229-6343. 304-229-6343. We have the tools, we have the talent. It's Miller time. It's Miller time on Talk Radio WRNR. A look at local sports with the play by play voice of local sports, Matt Miller. And we welcome you back into the second hour of Miller time, really, second hour and a half. We'll take you to 6 30 and bring you the Washington Nationals hosting the Miami Marlins 6.30 pregame, 7.05 first pitch from D.C. The Nationals trying to put two wins together after snapping a five-game five game slide last night, beating the Marlins 14-12, to coming back from a 9 nothing deficit. And, Matt, we are going to the phone lines once again as Matt Miller joins us from the Pitcher Chapel Road location of WRNR, a.k.a. his living room. We will go once again to the WVU Medicine Berkeley and Jefferson Medical Center talk line and bring in Trey Nepper of the Martinsburg Soapbox Derby. Trey, thanks for joining us this evening. You're welcome. Thank you. All right, Trey, let's just talk about the Soapbox Derby. I know you have a couple guys that you're sending out to Akron, Ohio, if I have the city in Ohio correct. Just talk to us about the Soapbox Derby as a whole. Yeah, so the uh, Soapbox Derby organization has been around for a long time, started in Ohio, uh, around Dayton, and now its headquarters is in Akron back in the 1930s. Um, they raced in Martinsburg from the 1930s through about the 1950s, and then it went dormant for a long time, and then members of the Classic or Norwalk Antique Classic Car Club got together and brought the race back to Martinsburg in the year 2000, and We've been rolling ever since. It's a great racing event for kids ages seven or seven to twenty, and um, it's fun for everyone. Brings families and the community and friends and family and everyone all together. Trey, you uh, we talked to us about possibly doing an event on Monday. You're having a send off at the. Chick-fil-A on Foxtrot Avenue, if I'm correct. Talk about that and what is going on with that send-off. Yeah, so um, every year we used to have our send-off party at McDonald's, and the owner of McDonald's would help organize and put it all together. But since she has sold those to another individual, so this year we're actually moving it to Chick-fil-A and also holding a spirit night at the same time. But we're inviting 
other derby families and racers to come on out and members of the community to wish our racers luck before they head out to Akron. We're going to have cake there and everyone's invited to enjoy a piece of cake and wish our champions good luck before we send them off. Ray, you have been to Akron and been a part of this All-American Soapbox Derby race. So now that you are in the leadership position that you are in, what is some of the advice maybe that you can share with these young racers as they get ready to experience for the first time something that you've been through? Well, now they're at a bit of an advantage because they get a couple more practice runs and some more racing throughout the week. Um, before the big day on Saturday. So my advice to them is going to be to, you know, take advantage of those opportunities just to get comfortable on a hill that they haven't raced on before. Um, play with your weight a little bit, experiment with your lines and which way you want to drive and just stay focused. Stay out of the air, be as aerodynamic as possible and, and let her roll. And um, we're actually here tonight preparing the course for Akron because we have to leave to take the cars up to Akron early tomorrow morning. Um, so they're here right now. We're making sure they're all waxed up and getting the weights right and all that good stuff so they're ready to roll. You talked about practicing and getting the, the feel, the road, and making sure they could fly down it as efficiently as possible. Is it kind of a universally... I guess universal road surface that everybody uses or does the road surface vary depending on where you are in the country? It can, it can vary significantly. Just kind of like other racing events, drag racing or NASCAR, you know, there's throughout the country, there's a lot of variation between how old the asphalt is and how smooth it is. And, um, as well as what area of the country you are, whether you're in Florida or if you're racing at the hill in Akron, um, so in fact, I will tell our racers an important thing to do is watch the kids from Ohio, especially Akron, Ohio, the kids who have a lot more experience on that hill, see what lines they're driving as they go down and Hey, they probably know the fastest way down the hill. So we might as well use their same line. <laughs> You mentioned those lines. There is a difference at this race for our local racers than the race that was held in Martinsburg in that in Martinsburg, as you start there at the top of the hill on the square by the library, it's two cars going down, one in each lane and working your way towards the finish line. When you get to Akron, there are actually three cars racing at one time. How different is that? Oh, it's completely different, especially if you're the one that's stuck in the middle lane and you got a car on each side of you. Um, so that's where it's really important to keep your focus and pay attention to your line and your race and not focusing on your competitors and if they're beating you or whatever. Um, the, the other thing is in Martinsburg, we actually have, you know, ramps that you come off of. It kind of levels up, let then the hill you know, kind of levels and then gets steeper and levels back out at the finish line. Um, at Akron, you, it's just the paddle that goes down and you're already starting at the steepest grade you're going to be for the entire trip down the hill. And then it kind of starts to level out near the finish line, but it doesn't level out nearly as much as what it does in Martinsburg. So in Martinsburg, a lot of racers will race like have their weight a lot more tail heavy to get that push down the hill. But in Akron, we have to set these cars up to be a lot more balanced um, as far as the physics involved and how the tracks are laid out. The weight of the cars, I know you mentioned having to adjust the weights and just previously mentioned where the weight is in the car. Is there a specific range that the weight has to be in for the cars or is it just however you can get your car down the hill the quickest? Yes, there's a maximum weight limit for each of the three divisions. And by maximum weight limit, it's total weight. So it's the combined weight of both the driver and the car itself. So for the beginning class, that stock division, the maximum total combined weight is 200. Super stock's 240 pounds, and the master's is 255. So if you have a child that's fairly small or fairly light, um, more than likely you got to add a bunch of a ton of weight to the car <laughs> to make it go faster and and increase that kinetic kinetic energy to get through the air resistance and all that how hard 
are these vehicles to steer and control? You've talked about focus. You've talked about keeping it on a specific line going down that hill. How hard is that? Well, it's, it's the more you practice it, the easier it becomes. Um, what's kind of unique about these cars is they don't really steer a whole lot because for the most part, you're going in a fairly straight line. Um, usually exactly straight down the line isn't always the fastest because you want to kind of get near the edge to, if there's a bit of a crown on the hill to get a little bit more of a downrun hill. Um, but it can be very easy and therefore hard. You know, you, it's very easy to overcorrect when you're steering these cars and that's when you want to kind of judge it to be as smooth as possible when you're steering it. Um, you can adjust how tight the steering is to an extent, um, based on what the racer is comfortable with. Um, but as far as finding that fine line and making your slight little steering adjustments without, you know, completely over steering and then swerving and all that is, a can be a pretty fine line. And, you know, and the ones in the racers that can do that the best and find that balance on those small little steering adjustments, they usually end up winning. So, How many representatives from Martinsburg are, you, are uh, coming and going to Akron? Is it one from each of those classifications you were just talking about? Yes, we're sending our, our first place winner, so our champion from each division. So this year we have Hank Plunker. He will be representing Martinsburg, West Virginia in the stock class. We'll have Sophie Gregory, who's waving at me right now. She'll be representing us in the super stock class. And then we have Nesson Mungavin in the Masters. And when is the actual race? And give us an idea of what each of these racers will experience as they get to Akron. And the All-American this year is on Saturday, July 21st. They will actually be heading up the Sunday before, which is like the 14th or 15th, I believe. And um, it's a pretty fun week. They On Monday, they have a big welcoming, a big opening ceremonies and a welcome parade that all the kids participate in. And all the kids get together from all over the world and they're throwing up throwing out stuff to the crowd and it's a pretty big deal and then throughout the week there's other fun activities for them to do um they all create their own little button that they get made up and they trade buttons with other racers and of course there's a lot of racing throughout the week now as well and they'll be very busy um getting their cars aligned and tuned up and swapping wheels and racing as well so it's a pretty neat experience from kids all over the country and also some other nations throughout the world that all get together for this one week a year well trey before we let you go just one more time uh, let the listeners know where the send-off is and what time and who, who all is welcome to come and so the send-off party will be monday evening from five to eight at chick-fil-a there in martinsburg we will be having cake at around 6.30, and everyone's welcome to come. Um, anybody from the community to come out and wish our racers good luck. Trey, we appreciate the time, and maybe we'll catch up with you after you guys get back from Ohio. All right. Sounds great. Thanks for the time. Yeah, you're welcome. Thank you. Again, that was Trey Nepper of the Martinsburg Soapbox Derby. Matt, we are just 16 short minutes away from – our weekend officially starting and taking everybody to Washington Nationals baseball. But before we get to our last segment, we have got to get in one more commercial break and pay some bills. So we will be right back after this for more Miller Time. You're listening to Miller Time on Talk Radio, WRNR Martinsburg. Can't touch this. Can't touch this. Downtown Martinsburg is the place to be for the Fridays at Five Summer Concert Series from June 1st through August 31st. Enjoy great music and fun with well-known musicians, bands, and Martinsburg artists that will liven up your spirits at the town square. Concerts begin at 5 p.m. and usually last until 7. Enjoy great music while visiting Martinsburg's Farmer's Market, housed on East King Street, where you're able to enjoy fresh fruits and veggies, chicken and pork, and a lot more. Pets are allowed in the square during the concerts, provided they're on a six-foot leash or less. For the full concert summer series lineup, go to MainStreetMartinsburg.com. 
The Honda 4th of July sales event has brilliant deals on our most popular vehicles, like the Civic, Fit, and Pilot. It's a reason to celebrate across the country, from the Liberty Bell to Hollywood, and even back up to Niagara Falls. So come discover the 2018 KBB.com best overall brand during the Honda 4th of July sales event. Now at your Honda dealer. Miller Honda South of Winchester, home of the Lifetime Power Trade Warranty. www.mymillerhonda.com. Based on 2018 brand inventory from Cali Global. Visit KBB.com for more information. For an Allstate agent, providing protection that fits your life is something they take, well, personally. Allstate agents are committed to learning about your needs and personalizing protection to meet them. From bundling your auto, home, and life insurance with ease to evaluating optional coverage based on your protection needs, your Allstate agent can build an insurance proposal that fits your life. Are you in good hands? Contact Martinsburg Allstate agent Gary Kelly today for a free quote at 304-263-4596. Life insurance offered through Allstate Life Insurance Company and Allstate Assurance Company, Northbrook, Illinois, and American Heritage Life Insurance Company, Jacksonville, Florida. Why buy from Apple Valley Chevy? Because Apple Valley Chevy will not be beat. You heard that right. We will not be undersold on any new vehicle. You have a better price? Bring it in. We will match or beat your best deal. Apple Valley Chevy has the best inventory, the best prices, and the best warranty. Why would you go anywhere else? Forget the manufacturer's warranty. We have a lifetime warranty. Standard on every vehicle. Come in today for your best deal. Apple Valley Chevy. Online at AppleValleyChevy.com or stop in at Foxcroft Avenue, Martinsburg. Martinsburg. On the baseball field, a single decision can change everything. A game, a season, even a career. For a man with prostate cancer, a single decision can change his entire life. This is Joe Torrey. When I was diagnosed with prostate cancer, I faced a game-changing decision. While I chose surgery, that might not be the right call for all patients. For some men, a less aggressive approach called active surveillance might be the best choice. Ask your doctor about a genomic test that may help you make the right decision. Learn more at yourprostateyourdecision.com. A public service message from Men's Health Network, Prostate Health Education Network, and Zero, the end of prostate cancer. Welcome back into this Friday edition of Miller Time. Matt, you and I are just 13 short minutes from reaching our weekend on this abbreviated work week, so not too bad. But we will send you to Washington Nationals Baseball at 6.30 with the pregame. First pitch at 7.05 as they try to take the second game from the Miami Marlins. Matt, before we get to our final topic, let's talk a little bit more about the Washington Nationals. And does a win tonight period mean that you think i mean i know the marlins are one of the worst teams in the majors but does it need to be a convincing win tonight if they get a win or does a win period really kind of show you that okay maybe they are starting to turn a corner a little bit or you do you need to see another extremely convincing win or a long stretch of wins i need to see a stretch of wins and it doesn't matter how they come i mean you'd like to see a little bit more run production i think that to me is the biggest thing can they begin to show some kind of consistency that says they can average more than three runs a game like they did in the month of june because you know, at any level, scoring only three runs a game is going to be very hard to consistently string together wins because your pitching and defense has to be so perfect in order to win three to two, three to one, three to nothing. So uh, to me, I, I don't care if it's high scoring, if it's relatively low scoring, uh, a win is a win right now, but they've got to put several of them together back to back. I mean, there's seven back right now in the NL East. That's a lot of games that they're going to have to make up uh, with a little over half the season already gone now. And you look at how differently we may be viewing the last couple weeks of the season. The five of the last six losses for the Washington Nationals have come by one run. So when you listen to Davey Johnson talk about, oh, I thought we played well, I thought we were in games, while it's still a loss in the scorebook, he, he isn't wrong. They were in games. They just couldn't find a way to get that big hit. But, I mean, I just imagine 
the way we would be talking about the Nationals right now if they would have won four of those five games or even three of those five games. Yeah, there wouldn't be nearly the panic, and especially if they went against the right teams. And my concern is they haven't necessarily played their best baseball against either the Braves or or the Phillies here in the first half of the season. And those are the two teams right now that they're chasing. So they've got to find a way to beat those teams, especially. All right, Matt, summer league, NBA basketball tonight. You going to turn in? Hang on. Before you leave baseball, I only bring it up because you mentioned it earlier. And I did look it up while I had the chance about Barry and Bobby Bonds. 1,094 home runs combined between the father son duo and that has them well in front of Ken Griffey Jr. and Sr. Believe it or not, those two combined for 782 home runs. So Ken Griffey Sr., not exactly a slugger. Then I guess that's the difference then. I mean, Ju- Jr. had several, several home runs. Yes. So, I mean, he, he carried the Griffey family. Okay, I, I didn't know what type of hitter Ken Griffey Sr. was, so I had no idea ballpark where to even guess that number, but apparently Ken Griffey Sr. was not the guy that was going to uh, gonna be a 40 or 50 home run a year guy. Well, but remember, Bobby Bonds, it says here in the article that I'm looking at, hit 332. Barry is baseball's all-time home run king, of course, at 762. Arguably the home run king. Yeah. I'm still <laughs> not sure I want to give him that record yet, but if you look in the record books, his name is there. All right, uh, Summer League Basketball, you tuning in tonight? Come on, NBA Summer League. Uh, no, I hadn't intended to. I, I apologize. Come on, really? Well, this, again, this is our remember, sport now. I'm a, I'm a radio guy. I, I, I don't do a lot of television. I get my sports mostly through radio or online. So I may check on some scores before going to bed just to get an idea. But otherwise, you know, you're, you're not hearing a lot of those summer games on our local radio here. Yeah, see, you're better than me. I guarantee you I won't even check any scores. I may see on social media somebody put a highlight up or something of one of the rookies doing something incredible. Like the highlights I saw last night of Grayson Allen getting into a scuffle with somebody because nothing ever changes. He didn't trip anybody, but there was still a scuffle in the game he was in last night. (laughs) Well, I question a little bit, and I know they don't play a ton of games here in this summer league, but, you know, you're talking about college guys that just got finished playing, what, 40 games, especially depending on how deep into the the March Madness uh, they, they were able to get, and they've had just a short time off, and now you're putting them back out there on the floor again and running them and working them and getting them ready to now play the longest season they've ever played in their lives. And I wonder sometimes if, if this is, you know, almost uh, too much of a push early. Well, I mean, it's the, they're professionals. They're supposed to be able to do this, right? I'm not well, saying it's going to be these easy. These are the same professionals who, you know, man, i, I got to take a few nights off. And the NBA, by the end of last year, is trying to talk to teams about, look, you know, people are paying money to come see certain players, and you're giving them the night off while they're on the road because they can't play too many games in a row. So, you know, even the, the, the guys get tired at some point in time. Well, yeah, that's an argument you and I have had over and over again. I'm sorry, you're a professional athlete. Play the game. You, you got to be off season to rest. But that's my point. There's no off season. There's a bit of an off season. A little one, not a big yeah, one. A little one. All right, moving on. We're going to talk some NFL. I know you're probably scratching your head right now, going, "What in the world could we be talking about?" It's not training camp. It's not the regular season anytime soon. It's not even preseason anytime within the next month or so. But a interesting idea that I heard slash read about over the last couple of days, and really it's been a thought that has really floated around for a long period of time now, but I don't think you and I have ever brought it to the radio waves, the airwaves, NFL free agency and its correlation with possibly ruining NFL rivalries. It's a topic that has been around since free agency has kind of hit its stride and really become that big of a thing. And it's just something that we we had some time tonight. There's baseball going on. We've gotten everything in. And do you believe that free agency has taken away the real emphasis of a rivalry within the players in the NFL? Rivalry within the players themselves. I don't know because I, I, I see where you're coming from. I can certainly understand where you may look at 
you know, a player that played for the Dallas Cowboys that now is a free agent signs with the Washington Redskins. While they're in Dallas, they couldn't stand D.C. And once they're in D.C., will they be able to keep that rivalry and now not like the Cowboys? I, I don't know if free agency has affected that as much or not. See, I just look back at, and this that's where it started. I heard somebody comparing the Redskins and Cowboys rivalry and the difference it's been since free agency became a huge thing. I mean, you look at the Redskins-Cowboys rivalry dating back in the 60s, 70s, and 80s, and it was arguably one of the greatest rivalries in sports, and it's because the players all hated each other. The coaches hated each other. And now the, the argument's being made that you have a player that's on his fourth team – who's now a Washington Redskin, he doesn't hate, and he's been in Green Bay, he's been in Arizona, he, he's not going to hate the Dallas Cowboys just because he's putting that Redskin jersey on. I, I can see that, but I, at the same time, I think you kind of develop a little bit or get into maybe is the way to say it, maybe not develop, but, but you, you kind of get immersed in the culture of where you're at. So, you know, you understand from the people that have been in the organization for a while and have been a part of that rivalry. You learn from the fan base and their reaction and, and the way they're getting fired up going into a given week. I think you learn to be a part of those rivalries, whether it's something that is in you at first or not. Well, the way I mean, I'm looking at just the Redskins. Obviously, I'm paying attention more to the Redskins rivalries than anybody else. It's almost like rivalries have changed over the last 10 or 15 years from the historic rivalries that the Bears Packers, which is always going to be there, Packers Vikings, Redskins Cowboys, Ravens Steelers, which was one of the best rivalries in all of sports in the mid to in the mid to late 2000s and into the 2010s. I mean, you look at the Redskins right now, I would say the Philadelphia Eagles are more of a rival than the Dallas Cowboys are, and I think that has to do with certain groups of players having tougher games and having more of a personal vendetta towards different teams than maybe the franchise has had in its history. And those rivalries will fluctuate. I mean, go to the collegiate level. I mean, I, I can even look at, at Shepherd University. You know, many years ago, Shepherd and Concord would have been uh, as big a rivalry as probably any through the years. Shepherd and Fairmont State has certainly been a very big rival. And, and yet through a, another couple of decades, there was a span for, you know, 14 out of like 18 years straight in the WVIAC that either Shepard or Glenville State went on to win or share the conference championship, depending on who won that matchup. And so that rivalry kind of raised its head. So maybe there's some of that going on in the NFL as well. Thinking about this from the Redskin perspective and you being a Tampa Bay Buccaneers fan, is there one team as a Bucks fan that you just hope loses week after week? Because I was thinking about it, and I couldn't – there's no obvious answer to that question from an outside fan. Well, and again, you, you're talking to a, a, a fan that has lost a lot of the fanatic part. Um, you know, New Orleans, obviously, because they're not that far away from Tampa geographically and because they are, you know, one of those key teams that you've got to beat in the division – uh, you know, I don't know if I guess Atlanta maybe fits a little bit into that as well. Uh, Carolina, because they're in the division as well. But, you know, yeah, I don't think there's it's not like Miami and, and Tampa have some kind of huge rivalry because they're in the state or Tampa and Jacksonville have some kind of huge rivalry. Of course, uh, one's AFC, one's NFC. They don't even see each other a lot. Uh, you know, from a Tampa standpoint. I would say probably New Orleans is one of the biggest. Yeah, that was just one of those things that I was curious about because I, I, it wasn't an obvious answer when it popped into my head. Look, when you haven't been very good as a franchise or, you know, as a team in individual years for a long time, it's hard to have too many big rivals. I, I would agree with that in my lifetime being a Redskins fan. All right, real quick, we got 30 seconds before we send it to the Nats. Score prediction tonight. Score tonight, Nationals uh, 6 and the Marlins 3. All right, I like that score prediction. I got eight, five Nats tonight. So the margin's about the same. About the same. All right, Matt, I'll see you Monday. Have a good weekend, buddy. You too, thanks. All right, you've been listening to Miller Time on Talk Radio WRNR. We send you now to Washington Nationals Baseball. Matt and I will be back. Hey, Baseball is back in Washington, D.C.
Baseball. Matt and I will be back. Six six four eight eight seven three eight six. Go Nats! DraftKings, the game inside the game. Here are Charlie Slows and Dave Jack. And we're here at National Park for Game 2 of a four-game series between the Washington Nationals and the Miami Marlins. Hello again, everybody. Welcome to Nets on Deck, presented by Draft Kings. Charlie Slows, Dave Jagler with you. As the Nationals will send Gio Gonzalez to the mound tonight, he'll make his 18th start, a 6-5 and five record against right-hander Dan Straley. He's won three and lost four. His 13th start for the Marlins.